Anyway, again, thank you very much. And now let me introduce to you Maggie Weatherby, our collections manager, who's been at Janum for the last three years. And so I hope you'll um, really enjoy this. Uh, Maggie's a great presenter, and we have some wonderful artifacts. And I think she always welcomes questions. So. Um, as Charlene mentioned, my name is Maggie Weatherby. I think a lot of you have been to one of these before, so you know that I'm the collections manager at Janum. And it is one of my jobs to make sure that we are not only showing artifacts in, to the public, but we're also preserving their stories. So, thank you for your membership is the first and foremost thing that we always want to say to you because it really does help in our day-to-day -day existence here at Jan. Um, <clears throat> I know today we are talking about um, Luau Takamoto. Is anybody here related to him? Does anybody here know him or his family? You do, we do have one. It happens a lot. I'm not asking because <laughs> I'm laughing because it, it knows. That's really great. So again, with all of these presentations that I do at Learning at Lynch, I really want this to be an opportunity for you to feel like you can join in the conversation. I don't want to lecture you. I want you to add your voice to the conversation because at Janum, you know that every voice is important and we want to make sure that everyone feels like they have a chance to contribute. Um, so we're going to talk about um, Uau Takamoto's story today. We're also going to talk about a few other gentlemen that kind of helped pave the way for people like him in his field. Um, because I always think that that's important. And if you've come to any of these at Janum, you'll know that I always base what I talk about on stories. Because that's what Janum is all about, first-person narrative stories. And that's what the Collections Management and Access Unit, which the unit that I'm in charge of, is tasked with, preserving the stories behind the artifacts. Because that's why it's important to us. So I'm going to start with a story <clears throat> about a, name, a man named Eddie Imazu. Anyone related to him? His first name is Edwin, Edwin Imazu. Anyone know his family? Anyone know him? Okay, it's okay, I just always check because usually there's a hand in here. Um, Eddie was the first graduate of Hollywood High School. He attended Berkeley University uh, and was, <clears throat> he was recruited by Metro Studios which later, of course, became MGM, right? He was an artist for them for many years. He worked on many films. He eventually became their art director. During um, the onset of um, <clears throat> the war, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, <coughs> MGM changed his address to the address of the studio because they wanted to try to see if they could keep his family safe with them at the studio. The government said that he could stay, but his family needed to go. And that wasn't okay with him. He was a pioneer with a lot of different art direction um, that, that came with the, um, the different studios, um, and especially with MGM. Does anybody know who Yuri Kochiyama is? She's a pretty famous lady. She was a very large activist. Well, he married her cousin. <laughs> he was married to her cousin. So there's that family linkage as well. And in our collection, we are very fortunate to have all of the original notes and photographs that he took. So I'm going to show you some of the photographs that he took today of the movie Go For Broke. It was done right after the war. It was all about... Um, it was about the 442nd, so if you guys, if anyone needs me to explain the 442nd further, I'm, again, I'm very happy to. I, I hate lecturing to the crowd. Um, but he was the art director for this particular film. And a lot of the people who starred in this movie were actually 442nd soldiers. Um, and so it's really interesting to take a look at his collection to see how he worked with the soldiers to depict them in a movie. Um, it's not copyrighted anymore. They let the copyright go, so you can actually watch the film on YouTube <laughs> if anyone is interested, if you haven't seen it. So um, we have some um, photographs he took here, a picture of him, and photographs he took of the set here. But he was, I'll walk around with him. So and you, again, at the end, everyone is welcome to come up, ask questions, um, stop me if you would like, uh, but you could kind of see. So he was one of the pioneers that really got Japanese Americans involved 
in the movie industry. So I mean, that's why I think it's important to talk about him as well. The, the family. So his family donated these, yes, for the camera. His family donated these photographs. They also donated all of his notes. Uh, I didn't bring the whole collection out, of course, because it's, we only have a short amount of time. And we're not talking mainly about him today. Um, but again, he's someone who paved the way for people to um, enter the, the film industry in the way uh, that he did. So he's number one person uh, to talk about. You should look him up. If, he's a really interesting guy um, if you're interested. And there's more pictures here that I'm happy to show you after. The next person I'm going to talk to you about is Chris Ishii. Anyone related to Chris Ishii? Anyone know Chris Ishii? Anyone heard of Chris Ishii? Okay. Anyone heard of Little Nebo? Yes, right? That's, that's much more um, uh, something that um, people hear of. So, okay, second artist that I'm going to talk about today is Chris Ishii. Chris was an um, animator at Disney. He animated lots and lots of different films for them, very early ones, um, uh, but was, was an animator for Disney. And when, they, when World War II broke out and he was sent to Santa Anita. Um, he was a young man who'd only been at Disney a very short time. He decided that the newspaper needed a cartoon. And I also think that he needed an outlet for his art, right? Who did you need an outlet for his art? So he had a contest. He had a contest in, in the Pacemaker newspaper. And we have every copy of the Pacemaker in the collection. I did not bring every copy out. <laughs> if you would like to see them, they're part of the collections that we digitized for Dead Show. So um, every, every single one is there if you, if you want to see it. They're from us. Um, and he had a contest to have this character that he drew. He drew this character here. And they named him Little Nebo, which is short for Little Nisei Boy, because he wanted to have a cartoon character that he could draw in the newspaper. This one, I really love. I brought it out because it's larger, so it's easier for you guys to see. But it's also, it's Boy Scouts going on a hike. So it's Chris Ishii um, trying to make sure he's capturing kind of everyday moments. Uh, we actually, I don't know if any of you saw it, but we just shared on our Facebook page on Election Day um, a Chris Ishii drawing of Little Nebo pretending to read a voter pamphlet when he's actually reading a Superman comic. If you haven't seen it, it's one of my very favorites. It's pretty, it's pretty great. So Lil Nebo was at, um, started at Santa Anita, and then he was at Amachi. So Chris was sent to Amachi, and we have this really fantastic, and I will walk around with it because I think it's really great, uh, drawing that he did. Um, and it says, uh, with best wishes to the Yoshikis, which were his family friends, Chris, and he drew a soldier. For them because they had a soldier that was a uh, son that was a soldier um, <clears throat> so again Chris is another early artist that I think paved the way for you well Takamo it's neat it's actually a really thick, thick piece of wood and it's kind of heavy <laughs> I'm, I was much uh, I was surprised by how heavy it is does anybody have any, remember reading any um, Little Nebo cartoons? Does anybody have any Little Nebo memories they want to share with us? We have a fantastic collection that was done by a Girl Scout from Amachi. She cut every single one of them out <laughs> and, and uh, took them uh, and gave them to us. We have scrapbooks of hers as well that are really fantastic. So again, a drawing that he did while he was at Amachi. Okay, so now we get to the fun meat of the presentation, which is of course about Iwao Takamoto. We have just a few pieces in the collection from him. Um, he was an animator. Um, anyone want to talk about things that they have seen that he's done? Any movies that he might have animated in? He did a lot. Anybody ever see Penelope Pitstop? I was so excited when I realized he animated Penelope Pitstop. <laughs> I was so excited about that. <laughs> uh, any, anyone else have anything that they think that they've seen him in? Yeah. 
Anybody? Richard? Oh, you're just moving. I thought you were going to have a... Uh, <laughs> Richard always shares. Yeah. Can that would be pit stop that's not Wreck-It Ralph? <laughs> No, it's not Rick and Ralph. <laughs> Dastardly and Snipe. Yes, they were. It's an old cartoon. Monthly. Yeah, and it's Penelope Pitstop is a. Um, and I really want my kids to watch it now. Uh, after I've started looking at everything here, uh, she's an heiress, and she's being chased by these dastardly foes that are going to capture her and take her money. And that was my, that's my little kid impression of what that show was about. There probably is a better uh, explanation about Penelope Pitstop. <laughs> um, okay, so Wow well, is, he is most well known for Scooby-Doo, right? Uh, one of the main animators behind. So these are, and some of the collection that we have here is way too big to bring out. So I only brought out the pieces that actually can fit on a table in this room. So this is a Scooby-Doo and of, of course um, his team. It, uh, this is a drawing that he did in 1969. So it's one of the older pieces. I think it's the oldest one we have. And again, you're going to have a lot of chance to come up and see these after. Um, so yes, he is most well known, of course, for drawing Scooby-Doo as a character. And again, I'm not an animation expert. I am a collections manager. So it is our job to try to make sure that we preserve the stories behind all of these. And... The other one that we have that we brought out is um, also Scooby Doo, but it's a little later, a little later time. And this one has an official sticker on the back of it. This one is called Strangers in the Night Scooby Doo, and it was created um, by Wild Takamoto. And there were only uh, a few of them, well, no, 250 of them printed. But again, he, his family donated this to us. So again, with some of, one of the famous Scooby-Doo characters. The biggest one we have has every single character he ever designed on it. And I would love to bring it out, <laughs> but it's, there was no, uh, it's very, very, very large. Uh, but it does, it has every single character on it. So someone here knows the family. Do you care to share any? Any stories you might have, you can say no. It's completely fine. This is, again, a sharing session if... Well, I didn't know you all, but I knew his brother very well. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early 1960s, we were bachelors about the same age, and we used to chase all the, after all the Japanese-American women. <laughs> <laughs> various house parties and you know, dances at that time. They had them all over Los Angeles. And also, we went skiing together. But I never knew he well, but um, I had sent Robert my book, and then uh, he in turn sent me he well's book. Yeah, which is great. There are a lot of really so wonderful there are publications. There's pictures in here uh, and circulated out here. Anybody else wants and, to see it? And, um, and we do have it for sale in the gift shop if you're interested. We can, you can uh, visit the GM store to buy a copy. So, yeah, so I never knew you well, but I knew yeah. his, his brother, Robert, very well. We still exchange Christmas cards. That's fantastic. Where did, Takamoto, where, did you, where did Takamoto's grow up? What? Where did Takamoto's grow up? Um, I don't know. But his brother was a, a kendo champion. Oh. <laughs> yes, so a little more about the family. Um, so Iwao... Um, learned how to draw at Manzanar. He was a young man, and that's where he learned from people like Chris Ishii, and people like um, uh, Eddie um, Imuso, and a lot of other teachers, right? So he, that's where he learned to draw. And um, it says that he, Drew and drew and drew and drew and drew until he had a good enough portfolio to go and um, work for, for a major studio. He is, of course, also the designer of Astro from the Jetsons. I think that 
was another favorite of mine. I, I really love Astro. But again, see, I think everyone can connect in some way to his artwork, which is great. Um, but that's where he learned from other people who were there who were artists who were also very early Disney artists. There were a lot of Japanese American boys who were taken from Otis, the art college here in um, Los Angeles, and worked for Disney. These are, these are just a few that we have represented in our collection, who I thought the stories would tie together nicely to talk to you about today. But there were, there were, there were a lot of them. There were a lot of um, Japanese American and Chinese American artists who went and worked for Disney. And if you ever get the chance, I, I have been inside the vault um, at, at Disney, and they keep all, they have 6.5 million drawings and animation artworks. Um, so I got to see some of their early work, which was really fantastic. Um, and again, it's, it's everyone building upon each other to get to where we are with someone like you. Well, yes? Uh, my question is, so I yeah. see, these seem to be posters. What uh -huh. are the other things in the Aweo Takamoto collection that you have? Do you have like cells? Or? I would have brought them out if we had cells. Okay. <laughs> because they're little and they're cool. No, we, we only, his family gave us very large pieces, um, probably because they didn't have room for them in their garage. <laughs> no, I don't know. I can't say that for sure, but <laughs> that does happen. We, we don't have any cells. Uh, we would love to have some. I think this is, this is a collection that we would love to grow. Um, because there are only very large pieces in this collection. It's a lot harder for us to use them. Um, I would really love to bring the one that has Penelope Pit Stop and you know, every little character that he's ever drawn on it for you, but it's not, it's not feasible. It takes up an entire, it, it doesn't even fit on the art rack we have. It takes up an entire shelf by itself. Um, so, but the interesting thing I think is that his, um, his son is an animator as well. His son animated, was an animator for the Smurfs. <laughs> which again mainstay of my childhood so preparing for this program is really fun right? because because really it's I think it's all about these interesting men who taught their craft who shared it while during an experience that wasn't the most ideal situation and then helping these kids along um, on their journey does anyone have any anyone want to come up and see anything does anyone have any questions does anyone have? Yes, go ahead. The, the one on the left is a poster. You know, it's, the mm -hmm. one on the right it looks hand. Yeah, it hand. is. It is. It's um, <clears throat> when you see it up close, it's watercolor and um, probably pen, some some other typo. It's yes, and it's a lot older. And honestly, the um, collections manager and me, we need to take them out of the frames. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be stored like this. That was actually my, my first thought when we looked at doing this program. But I wanted to leave them framed until after the program. Because I can't bring them out. It's a lot harder for me to bring them out to see. You, for you to see. If they are not framed. Um, because, it's, again, they're off-gassing on themselves if I want to be technical about it. Um, so it's, yes, they're safe this way. But over time, so in 200 years, when someone wants to do a program after they've come in on their hoverboard or whatever, we get to do fun in 200 years um, that they've been imagining since day one. We want it to be in this good shape. And that's my job. That's my job at Janum is to make sure when your great-great-grandchildren come to visit artifacts, they're in this, this, the same exact condition that they were when, when they were brought in. They were brought in. So. And again, um, I think it's Im important that we all uh, really look at the stories of each individual person and how they all influenced each other over time. And that's, that's why Janum is here. And we really want to make sure that everyone's story, you don't have to be famous like any of these three men for your story to be important to us. Because I think every story is an American story and every story is valuable. So if you ever feel the need to say, I, I have something I want to show you, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be that person for you. I'm happy to have my team be that person for you. And um, we, between John and myself, we um, want to really make sure, especially our members, feel like if you need anything from us, um, we're here for you. Even if it's, I have a picture hanging on my wall of my grandparents and it looks different than it did last year. Mm -hmm. That means something's happening and I'll help you. Because mm -hmm. that's what I do.
Does anyone else have anything they want to comment on or share about any of these men? Any of anyone love animation? Anyone have a favorite character they want to talk about? Because again, don't worry, you're, you're going to have time to come up and look at everything in detail and ask more questions if you don't feel like asking the group. Did you know, did he, mm -hmm. did, did Takamoto work for uh, Hanna-Barbera first or was he hired, I mean, Hanna-Barbera worked at MGM mm -hmm. and they developed Tom and Jerry at MGM yeah. and yeah. they were famous for that and they carried it over. Yes. Did, um, and since Eddie worked at MGM as well, I just wondered, did Iwao work at MGM first or? Yes. He did? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looked like from the information I saw that he did. Oh, that's great. So it's interesting, right? Because and all of these people... At Disney also. Yes, and he also worked at Disney. So there, all of these men probably crossed paths, right? And who knows if their families knew each other and um, if they went to picnics together, right? <laughs> so it was where... <laughs> that's why it's so interesting to me, the whole, the whole world um, of animation in that time period. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. The, the movie that the... the First yes. one, Go for you talked about, uh -huh. Uh -huh. was Go for Broke, is that what you said? Yeah, that's the now, name of the film. He said that he worked with the real soldiers that were in the movie. Uh -huh. what, what way do you help the guys get used to being in a movie? What did he do? Did they, do you know anything about... We, we know from his notes that they just kind of let them do their thing, because they were soldiers, and they had been for a really long time. So there's a scene where a guy is from Hawaii is playing the, the ukulele on the stairs, and that's what he did. So they asked him to do it in the movie, oh, cool. right? So a lot of it was just trying to make sure that they felt free to be themselves on, on the set. Because there were, of course, other people that weren't in the, uh, soldiers who were in the movie as well. But a lot of those type of scenes in the movie are very, very accurate because they just had them trying to be the same guys they were who were on the front lines. Um, which I think is really interesting. And I, think it was, I thought it was so interesting that they had a Japanese-American art director for that film. Right? That was, to me, was very forward thinking <laughs> for, that, for that time because it came out right after the war was over. <laughs> and I do have to say that Eddie, um, MGM sent him a cable because that's what he did <laughs> in, in those days, right? The day after his family was released, offering his, him his job back. So I think a lot of the studios were very supportive also in that time period when it was not easy for everyone to come back and get a job which is really amazing as well. I mean, we see them as these big conglomerates that just make movies, but back then they really cared about who was there and they tried to help. They tried to help, um, which to me is an amazing story in and of itself as well. Any other questions? The cheat sheets. Yes, I know, the cheat sheets. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so Eddie also, yes, it was the great Ziegfeld. That's what he won his Academy Award for. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, yeah, first graduated of Hollywood High School. Okay. Oh, this is another interesting bit. Sorry, I should have mentioned this before. Okay. <laughs> I always say his name wrong. The very, very famous Japanese actor who was here. Yes. Someone say that louder. Sashue Yakima. Okay. He got, he got him his job. He went, he was invited to a party at his house. And he pointed him in the direction of um, an executive, and the executive hired him on the spot. And asked him if he wanted to be a cameraman, or if he wanted to be in the art department. <laughs> and since he was studying architecture, he chose the art department. And that's how his career started. So he was an architecture student at Berkeley who ended up working and becoming a very, very influential individual at MGM because he went to a party. <laughs> how, how great is that? Networking. Yes, networking. You know, don't, don't, um, okay, so yes, and he worked there, um, he had a 50, 50 year career in Hollywood, uh, and again, his story is the interesting one because his family, they tried to get them to stay at the studio location because they, that was what they tried to do. Um, okay, you want to know more about, uh, it wow, though. Okay. So the Walt Disney productions that he worked on, he worked on Sleeping Beauty, Lady and the Tramp. Oh my gosh, that's where the Willie <laughs> he's so connection comes in, of course. Um, and uh, and Cinderella. Now I should say that Chris Ishii worked on Dumbo. 
So who knows, right? The contact that they had with each other. And he, Chris Ishii, also illustrated a lot of the Mickey short cartoons that you see. Those were his projects. So again, who knows how much influence these guys had on each other. Uh, it's, but it looks from the outside like a lot. Um, so those were his, um, <coughs> excuse me. Yes, so eventually he was the director and producer and I, we talked about that. Um, he graduated from Thomas Jefferson High School in Los Angeles. So he was an LA boy. Um, they, he was at Manzanar and he received his training, like we said, um, from his fellow, there were art instructors that gave him his chance. And he drew, and this is a quote, everything he saw <laughs> to create a portfolio after the war. Because he didn't have, he'd never gone to school. So he just knew what he learned from men like this who were at Manzanar with him. And he used it as a portfolio to get his first job, which was at Disney. And obviously, I would think that there were other men there pulling for him, right? Because you don't just walk up with a portfolio of art to Disney and say, here, you should give me a job. <laughs> At least I don't think that's how it works, or even if it did uh, then. Um, so yes, he was the assistant to Milt Call, one of the original animators for Disney. I think that helped his career immensely um, because he, he assisted him with all of his animation. Uh, uh, he also did Peter Pan, my personal favorite, uh, Lady and the Tramp, I said that one, and 101 Dalmatians. Those were the films that he ended up doing before he, before he left. Um, I think most everything else we talked about already. Let's see. So he, he was married twice. He has one, one child. Um, he, also, he married someone who was at Disney as well. I think a lot of people did in those days, Mary, colleagues. Um, and he has one son who, like we talked about, um, was an animator for the Smurfs. So he's retired now as well. He would really like his collection too. <laughs> and we have our wish list of things we would like to add to Janum's collection. So again, these are all three stories that we don't know for sure are connected. But definitely, they all worked in similar places, same types of time frame, and they all helped each other out along the way. Um, and if it wasn't these three men, it was other men in their positions working together. And I think that that's a really interesting story. And there are a lot of people like Willie Ito out there who um, their collections haven't been discovered yet. So I, I think if you know anyone who was an animator, um, my husband actually grew up with a whole bunch of animators in his neighborhood. So you, ne you never know. <laughs> we would really like to, to hear um, from them. Because again, it, I like talking to you about all of these things, but it's, like John said, a first person narrative talking about their own collection is, it, of course, the best way to go. So, so there was another artist from, who he knew from Disney, Edamachi, who continued the, the comic strip while he was in the military intelligence service. Mm -hmm. After the war, um, he worked for a lot of different publications, and you can actually see some of his drawings in the Pacific Citizen, which probably you all have copies of at home. <laughs> so each of them really led a, I think, interesting life in their own way. And I hope you learned a little something. I'm always happy when we all learn something from someone in the audience because I am never the definitive voice about any of this. I'm the person in charge of making sure it's safe and that its stories are collected. And we're always really thrilled when you participate. Um, so thanks for coming. And if anyone would like to, oh, I, we didn't do that, sorry. We got off track, okay, <clears throat> the very exciting. Okay, so the last few days in the back have been what we have called Takei Christmas. Takei Christmas is going through 300 boxes of archives that George Takei just donated to us. Hence, Takei Christmas, because it is like Christmas. You're going through this amazing archive of um, Takei. So, we're getting ready to do a very large, wonderful exhibition on the life and experiences of George Takei, not only as a person, um, uh, but all, following his career and following his path from um, through his life story. And it's, it's going to be the first in a series of exhibitions about Asian Americans in the media. 
So it's just the first one. And to Kay Christmas um, is yielding a whole bunch of really fantastic possibilities for our next two um, programs where we, we talk about artifacts at Learning at Lunch. They're both going to be George Takei themed. And we're going to be bringing out artifacts that are not shown in the exhibition. Uh, and you can really get a good behind the scenes glance kind of at what George's life is like. Um, because we were really, really fortunate. Brad and George were home when we collected everything at the house. And Brad made, um, with John's team's help, we have a video of every single box coming in with commentary from them. Uh, and it's really an amazing uh, look at, at his, his career and things. The hard part for us is we weren't allowed to ooh and awe. <laughs> and that was really hard. <laughs> so I would really recommend that you look to see when the next few um, learning at lunches are. Um, and, and if you're interested at all to come because it will be a fun journey into the life of, of George Takei. And you can also see the exhibition because it will be uh, up then as well. So, and yes. his, his play is going to be shown at local theaters, yep. a phantom, phantom of event. Uh -huh. And I've already got my ticket. On <laughs> December, it's on December 13th. If you didn't get a chance to see Allegiance and would still like to, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, and I'm actually taking, we have our first loan request for the, for the collection already, and I'm flying artifacts out on Monday. So that's, that's what we do. And again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your contributions. And thank you at most for being members. That's, that's the most important.